Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Happy post GAC for those who are able to join. All right. And just to make sure that everybody is awake and connected, once you can get in the uh, Zoom and can hear me, drop an emoji in the chat that explains your weekend. Hopefully, for those of you that had long weekends, got plenty of rest in there too. Susan always coming in with us with all the fun, the boat life. Appreciate you. <laughs> a little bit of baseball, a little bit of sleep. All right. Well, while everybody gets connected, I want to thank you all for joining us for our first Small Credit Union Summit of 2023. As we continue our partnership to ensure that we have strong credit union support resources for credit unions of all asset sizes, we look forward to welcoming you to these quarterly events all throughout 2023, hosted both in person and virtually. And just to give you a snapshot of what we will be covering on today's agenda, we'll first be starting off with Sydney Serrell, our Vice President of Advocacy here at LSCU, for advocating for small credit unions and ways to advocate as a small credit union. We will then be hearing from Misty Waldrop on low-cost marketing resources for small credit unions. And then also Avery Ragsdale will be joining us with lending and enhanced interviewing skills. So with that, I will go ahead and get ready to turn over to Sydney, who serves as LSCU's Vice President of Advocacy after starting her career with LSCU as Georgia's Senior Director of, Federal Affa of Governmental Affairs in June of 2020. Prior to the League, Sydney worked for the American Chemistry Council in various capacities most recently as the Director of Political Mo Mobilization, ACC's Grassroots Advocacy Department. Sydney also worked at the Georgia State Senate in various cap capacities and ran a successful campaign for current Senate President Tim Perd, John F. Kennedy, a then first time candidate for Macon, Georgia, as well as other statewide and state Senate campaigns. And with that, Sydney, welcome to the first 2023 Small Credit Union Summit. Awesome. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. I'm so excited to be with you all and get to talk a little bit about um, how small credit unions can really uh, be the strategic differentiators in advocacy. So let me share my slides real fast. Here we go. All right. Um, so small asset size credit union, large voice in advocacy. Um, I, lead our LS I lead the LSU's advocacy efforts, and this is something that um, we are seeing up close and personal right now as the Georgia legislative session has been in full swing. We're looking ahead to Alabama and Florida who start their sessions tomorrow. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Next slide. So the asset size of your credit union does not dictate the impact that you can have in the advocacy space. In fact, as we've been in the swing of things here in Georgia, what we're seeing is it's actually an advantage. The, the smaller your credit union, the more you're in your communities, the more you're building those close relationships, the more the more legislators are saying, oh, yeah, I, I know that branch. You know, I go to church or with a, you know, with a branch manager. I know their teller. They've been there for years. And so that's really where your advantage comes into play. And oftentimes in the advocacy space, those relationships help you have the loudest voices in advocacy. The smaller your credit union, the more local the impact, the community service work you're doing, the members you're supporting and working with every single day and getting to know them on a personal basis, that goes a very long way, not just for your, for your credit union's reputation in the community, but also um, for your local lawmakers who represent you um, either at the state capitol or um, up in D.C. 
So leaning into your service and what your credit union does, having a very close understanding of, uh, of what your community needs, that's really an advantage in the advocacy space and it's how you can truly move the needle. So your credit union can have the loudest voice. I saw Tiffany was on here from Romecraft Employees and uh, they are one of the most active credit unions here in Georgia. And they're a smaller credit union up in the Rome area. But anytime I, I say, hey, we've got an issue going on in, in Senate Banking Committee and, you know, you've got a your your local senator is on the committee. Can you pick up the phone and call them? Oh, yeah, we're happy to do it. And that senator knows that knows that credit union and knows the communities and membership that they serve. And it makes a really, really big difference. And oftentimes, you know, having those relationships from the get go and then being able to mobilize quickly is really where you can set yourself apart. So outside of those relationships, what leads to those relationships can often be LSU PACs. So our political action committees, which so many of you support um, every single day. And what, what that allows us to do is to look at legislators who are hoping to become state senators, state representatives, congressmen, whatever it is, and making sure that they align with credit unions. And oftentimes, because you're in the community and you've all, all you know, oftentimes been there for a long time, we can, we can go to you and say, hey, you know, we're looking at such and such member who's looking to, you know, run for state senate. Do you know them? Oh, yeah, I see them at the grocery store all the time. Or they've been a member for so long. Um, in fact, when we were in D.C. for CUNA GAC last week, um, Eric Nystrom's credit union down in Florida, there's a new congresswoman, and she's been a member there for years. So she walks in, we're at the Capitol, and we're having a meeting, and she said, oh, wait a second. I forgot to pay my car loan and the check sitting on the counter and the CEO had a relationship and said, well, have your husband bring it on by or we'll come pick it up. And that's a perfect example of having those local relationships. And it's a smaller credit union, but that allows you to have actual relationships, not just with your members, but members who can sometimes become elected officials. So when we're looking at political investment into credit union friendly candidates, if our trade association is reaching out to you, you know, you might have that 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 knowledge. Oh, they've been a member for so long. Oh, you know, we know their their father, their son, whoever it is. And that truly is so helpful because that's how we can get to know, you know, other than reading a bio, you know, going to you who's been in that community and knows that person that can help give us give us a better understanding of how they might be when they get into the legislature. And so a lot of you, a, a lot of credit unions, no matter the asset size, everybody has a goal for, for the PAC, whether it's a state PAC for state elected officials or LSU federal PAC for our, for our congressmen and women and senators um, supporting those PACs, which again, so many of you do, and it doesn't matter the dollar amount or the investment. It just allows us to help build those relationships and get a true understanding of where they might be um, credit union wise when they get to the legislature. And just a reminder that these these packs that we have are nonpartisan always. We're all most important part of the candidate vetting process is will they be supportive of credit unions? And not just will they be supportive, but do they understand the difference that credit unions serve and the members that they serve and how they serve them and how you know your member, you know, perfect example. You know, there's a lot of conversation at the federal level right now about overdraft and pulling back on overdraft fees. Well, you know you know your members might come to you and say, you know, hey, like I actually utilize overdraft. That's how I pay my bills because it's more cost efficient to do it that way than being forced towards a more pay predatory payday lender or something like that. And you know your member and you have that one-on-one -on -one interaction and that's, it, it's really important to just have that, have that tie together. So utilizing your credit union size as a strategic differentiator, I think, you know, there are large, large, large credit unions, there are mid-size, there are small to medium, and then there are small credit unions, and every single credit union has a voice. I think we've uh, belabored the point about the relationships that you can build, but I, what I would encourage you to do is think about not... To make advocacy more approachable, not that, well, I'm not sure how I fit into it, but reshape your thinking 
as well, I actually can play a huge, a, a huge part in the space. You know, we're working on an issue right now in the Georgia legislature, and I have senators coming to me saying, you know, I, I got 200 emails, you know, from, from our grassroots action alert, but who's in my district who can call me and tell me how this will affect me? And the first thing you do is go to project zip code, which we encourage you to update if you haven't in a while. Um, and we look to see, okay, which credit union has a branch or has a significant amount of membership in that district. And that allows us to reach out to you and say, hey, you know, you're right down the road from their, you know, from their office, their law office, whatever it is. Do you happen to know this center, senator? Do you know this representative? And or regardless of that, would you be willing to make a call? You know, hey, you're in the, you're, uh, you know, in the community right down the road every single day. You're representing, you're serving their members, that legislator's constituents. Can you make a call about how su such legislation would impact your credit union and the ability to serve your members? And I can't tell you how many times that happens. And not that we don't appreciate and love our large credit unions, but they don't always have those relationships in the communities that you have. They can make a call, you know, from a more corporate, you know, approach, but that doesn't always move the needle as much as somebody who's down in South Georgia and wants to hear from the only credit union in their entire district because they know that credit union and they know they're there and they know the work you do. So I just want to encourage you at your credit union to see your asset size as more of a strategic differentiator and an advantage rather than trying to figure out how you fit into the piece of advocacy because every single credit union can move advocacy. And in fact, uh, when I, you know, when our lobbyists get calls about wanting to hear from their district, that's really where, where we're looking at the smaller credit unions to help do that. So I just wanted to share a quick little case study and a perfect example of how a small credit union can be helpful and successful in the advocacy space. So not to get too much into the details, but there was a small uh, Georgia credit union under $15 million in assets was having a hard time getting their members car loans because of a current restriction in Georgia statute that had to do with the percentage where you could make a loan up to a certain percentage of net worth with while also needing board approval. And so oftentimes credit union who's the CEO, member service seller, everything wearing all these hats is waiting on phone calls from their board to be able to approve loans based on the, the very stringent policies in which you're able to do this. And so this credit union came to us and said, you know, I, I just want to get somebody into a truck. So they're not, they're not getting frustrated and waiting, you know, on me to hear from my board member to receive approval. They get so frustrated, they go down the street to a larger credit union or to another financial institution. That's the last thing we want to do. They're coming to the credit union. We want to get them into, into a truck, into a car, whatever it is. We want to take care of the loan that they're looking at. And so we started looking at the issue and we looked at his local legislators and I said, well, here's, here's the first thing, you know, one, you know, we're chatting with the regulator to get their thoughts on the issue before we're, we're running ahead to, to move the needle on this. But he started contacting his state senators, his representatives saying, look, I'm, I'm just, I'm stuck here because I'm literally waiting on board approval to get, you know, a $50,000 loan for somebody. And so this was a couple year long process. And what we ended up doing is in our current state charter modernization bill in Georgia this year, there's a fix that the state representative who's on the banking committee and the state senator who's now in leadership really advocated for on behalf of this credit union. And it's included in the bill to allow some more flexibility. So instead of your small credit union having to wait and to get board approval, they can go to the Department of Banking and Finance and up, you know, up to a certain percentage, either, you know, up from 5% of net worth up to $150,000. Credit unions can go to the regulator and say, hey, you know, we're, we're well within the, um, you know, within the restrictions of, of statute and rules. Can you, can you approve this loan? And the department feels good because they're a part of it and they're overseeing the process. And the credit union feels good because they're not having to turn away a member, let alone helping to increase their, their net worth and drive positive growth for the credit union. So I just want to say, you know, it's been sailing through the legislature this year and it's a, it's a 110 page bill and it's just a few lines of, uh, of language in that bill, but 
if he hadn't have been making calls and going to chamber meetings and rotary and and just advocating on behalf of what he needed to help serve his members, it might not have been able to, to stay in there. So I just like sharing that story because I think, you know, I, I never want you to feel like your credit union doesn't have a place to, to move the needle and, um, and help build relationships in the process. So, so that's my, uh, a, a few words of wisdom and just how just how your your credit union can be such a big player in advocacy space and truly be that differentiator where we really need it, where you're seeing credit unions merge and become larger and larger and larger. And that sometimes takes away from that small town um, advocacy voice that really is so helpful. What an amazing story of the power of us all coming together, Sydney. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I would love to open it up to the group at this point to maybe share other examples or other issues in which we can come together to assist small credit unions specifically. Because for those of you that I have the pleasure of knowing, you most likely know that I truly for all and that I want to prioritize ensuring that we continue to work on your behalf, whether it is advocacy issues such as this or other ways that we can provide resources and support. So any other questions, examples for Sydney and the advocacy side? Don't be shy now. We have to make sure nobody's falling asleep on a Monday morning. All right. Well, with that, thank you, Sydney. Thank you so much for your time. And of course, her contact information has been dropped in the chat. Or as always, please feel free to reach out to your member engagement consultant, and we'll be happy to connect you at any time. Hi, guys. I'm Evan. I'm an event coordinator here. I wanted to introduce Misty, who's going to be speaking for us next. Misty Waldrop is a marketing manager with Growth by Design. Um, she is a marketing lender in the credit union industry, bringing over a decade of experience to her role in marketing um, as a marketing manager. Um, under her leadership, credit unions have seen significant growth, improvement, operational efficiency, and increased member satisfaction. Misty has a degree of business administration and has completed several professional development programs. Um, with her experience, passion for the credit union industry, and unwavering commitment to excellence, Misty has to lead credit unions into the future and help meet the evolving needs of their members. She's been wonderful for us. We love working with her and she's got some wonderful ideas of low cost marketing solutions that will make a big impact on your small credit union. Hi, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I'm so excited to kind of discuss some of the common trends that we're seeing in the digital marketing space. Let me get this. Thank you so much, Evan. Thank you, ma'am. You are the best. Um, so yes, my name is Misty. I work with Growth by Design. And, you know, I think especially in the small credit union uh, movement, uh, there are a lot of inexpensive things that can really be poignant for your credit union and your community. Thank you, Evan. Um, you know, the credit unions, especially small credit unions, you play such an important role in providing those financial services for um, across the United States, millions of people. But it really, especially in your community, is for those that are underserved by traditional banks. Um, in a really fast paced business world, it's really important for even if you're a small credit union to be really visible and accessible and to be aware of who your target audience is. But marketing, especially on the type, can be really expensive and uh, really challenging to navigate. And that's why we're here today to kind of go through some solutions and find some creative and effective ways to reach your target audience. Some of the items we're going to be covering um, are going to be, let's see here, sorry. Um, there we go. We're going to be going over some social media, email marketing, referral marketing, 
community involvement, partnership marketing and what that looks like for your community, and personalized member service as a way to drive business and engage with members. Thank you. Okay, so for social media, um, I always get this whenever I'm working with small uh, and medium-sized credit unions. Social media is kind of that ugly beast in a room. You don't really want to be there, but it's important to hold the space. It's a really effective way to reach your target audience and build out your brand uh, using platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and even LinkedIn. Um, are really great. And of course, they're free to use uh, unless you want to spend some ad money. And so when you're promoting your products or services, sharing news and updates, you're engaging with your audience, social media marketing can really help you build that community around your brand and increase your visibility. Since a lot of these channels are free to build your account, it's a really good way for you to stay connected with your membership. And you can share that really valuable and important content and engage with your followers. And you can almost create just an entirely different social community within Facebook specifically is where we're seeing a lot of success for small credit unions. Whenever you are running ads, even if you boost a post by just $1, you can target your specific demographics and increase your reach. Um, and one thing that I'm seeing that is really effective, specifically with Facebook and Instagram, is not just you posting continually, it's also engaging with your membership. So if a member's commenting in you know, a Facebook post, it's getting your person that's appointed to your social media um, you know, liking, commenting, what they're saying, because it boosts your algorithm so other people will engage. Um, something that we have seen is you don't have to put a lot of money behind your ad spend, but as long as you consistently, even if it's a dollar or two dollars for all of your posts, you can really gain a lot of analytics and see what's pivotal and what is, you know, the most beneficial item. Um, Members are more uh, apt to engage when there are real photos. Uh, I love seeing staff highlights where they're highlighting maybe member service, a teller or a loan officer, and also seeing you out within the community. Generically, you're going to see some trends within Facebook uh, versus Instagram. Facebook is typically female. Uh, it's a little bit of an older demographic. The average age of a Facebook user is 40. Um, People are more willing to read information. So if you have a redirect or you have something that's a little bit lengthier, has more words. Uh, but most of the time, the people that are utilizing Facebook, they want engagement. It's easy to tag community partners, which is what we're going to get to in just a little while. And then also it's, it's cheaper than other sources of social media to promote on. Some of the trends via Instagram, it is a younger demographic. It's more image and video driven. It's a more casual engagement. So sometimes if someone's going to like a post on Instagram, they're not anticipating having you reach back out about anything, um, but it is more expensive to promote on. I think it's just generically really important to realize that the average consumer has to see your brand over 20 times before they decide to even Google search you or look up or consider being a member. Thank you. Okay, so email marketing is one that I feel is really beneficial. It's very cost effective. You can send out, you know, information on your services and what you offer. It's really common to see, you know, your newsletter, your promotional emails, and other content to really keep your members up to date. Uh, something, if you're utilizing constant contact, I think really um, something that isn't commonly seen is you can segment your email list. And so when you are building out, you know, your email list, you can put it for a specific demographic. So look maybe at just an age group. And so you can personalize the messages, whether it's a first time home buyer, maybe that makes sense for a certain age group. And so I think it's great, especially when you're utilizing constant contact to create kind of separate email list. That's something that we do here within the league. Often we say, okay, who would this be most beneficial to? 
Um, and so here we go. So not only when you send out your emails, are you keeping members informed, but if you utilize constant contact, it's not very expensive and it's based off your email list for, as far as pricing goes. But as your members are engaging with the emails, as they're opening them, you get real-time analytics and you can see how well your email is doing. And as you're reviewing those, you can kind of pivot the layout. They have pre-done templates that are free. You don't have to have anything super formal, but it does help with your future messaging if you can, you know, tailor that specifically to your membership base. Something I have really enjoyed seeing is they have hotspots on Constant Contact. So whoever your account manager is, when they go back in to review the current email campaign, they can see where members are spending the most time. Just an example, we have a, a credit union that's going through a conversion. It goes live today, a nightmare for all credit unions, but we have sent out numerous emails. And what we have found and that I found was kind of interesting is, you know, they're getting this, you know, long email full of instructions on, you know, how do you, how do you prepare? What do you do with your bill pay? What's going to happen when I log in for the first time? But when we went back and looked at the hotspots, we kind of found that people were only clicking in two spots, the learn more button. They were only spending a couple seconds. They weren't reading any of the content. They would hit learn more, or they were going directly to the social media channels because they can kind of get the most prevalent information in a very short way. I kind of found that shocking. So when we're sending out our emails, this is kind of a common thing that I'm seeing um, for some other larger brands. Emojis are really popular. Um, I was kind of shocked by that, but really tailoring your, your subject line to be really catchy. Um, doing personalized emails so it looks like it's coming directly from the CEO or maybe a loan officer, and then always having that call to action towards the bottom. And then also making those multiple email lists and reviewing as those email campaigns go out. Okay, referral marketing. This one may not make sense for all credit unions, right? But, you know, if you have someone um, that is willing to share your message on your behalf, it you know that doesn't cost anything. And so, word of mouth is, you know, it instantly gives you loyalty, it gives you brand awareness, and people know. Well, if I can trust Miss Sue from the hair salon, I know that you know it's probably a good place. You know, you can offer incentives incentives to your existing membership and for them to refer to your friends and family. And you know, that can increase your membership base. Something I have seen that has really um, been a great asset is creating an, a really easy process for people to leave reviews. You know, you think about anytime you go anywhere, whether it's a restaurant, credit union, you know, anywhere that you're going, more than likely you're gonna look at the reviews before you go there. And so something that's really easy to do, whoever's in charge of your Google My Business account, when they open it up um, and go to review the actual things that people have said previously, in the right-hand corner is this little blue button that says, get more reviews. And then on the right, you'll see kind of the graphic and that's what it looks like. So it's just a link. You can embed that into your email or just create like an email signature, an image where if someone clicks on it, it automatically prompts them to whatever address you decide, whether it's branch specific or just, you know, maybe the main office and they can instantly leave you a review. Um, I think those special signatures are really fantastic um, depending. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I We're dancing around a little bit. Um, sorry, my bad. I scrolled. <laughs> so sorry. No, that's I'll okay. get you back on the right spot. No, no, you are perfect. Um, and so what I really think is important, it's okay. <laughs> um, what, <laughs> no, you're good. What I think is really good with these Google reviews is you can create just a specific 
uh, signature line. And then whatever staff is in charge of sending up those follow-up emails with members, I think it's just important to note that this doesn't make sense to make your primary signature that just defaults. Often when you're dealing something, you know, with some things within the credit union, they may not be super positive experiences. However, you know, if someone closes a loan and then you just set a reminder on your calendar to check in with them and, you know, we can have just to say, hey, how's your new auto doing? How's, you know, do you have any questions? I'm going to send you your coupon book, whatever it is you're sending them then put it in there. You're not being too pushy, but you know, it's still relevant and that can help you because they're still excited and motivated from their new car loan. Um, another item I feel like a lot of people aren't doing is just sending an old fashioned thank you note. I don't know when the last time you received a thank you note in the mail was, but for me, I have probably not received one in a while. Um, so you can get one that's branded and pretty, or you can just go to Walmart and get a stack. Ma'am, community involvement. This isn't one that I feel like small credit unions need a lot of help with. They're already doing it. You know, they are the leaders within their community. I think it is good um, to market it. However, you know, it can increase your visibility and it can help you build relationships with potential members. You know, sponsorship uh, with local events and organizations, whether you're staff is volunteering their time or they have a really unique hobby that benefits a lot of people by when you become an active member in your community um, you know you're able to spread a lot of literacy and financial literacy I think what's important though is not only doing the items that you're probably already doing but you know making sure that you're sharing that online via social media, in your newsletters, you know, make sure your staff is aware of the good things that's happening within your credit union, because that kind of, you know, those kinds of items can have a big impact. And, you know, it shows your community that you're really ingrained. So partner marketing is, is probably not the official phrase that it should be called. Um, but really, I think when you can partner yourself with other community leaders, um, you, you know, you or other local businesses, you really can build some really fantastic relationships. You can increase your visibility and you can ultimately drive growth back. So this wouldn't make sense, right? If if you were trying to partner with a local insurance agent, that wouldn't make sense, right? Because then you're kind of crossing the lines where you're sending them business and they're sending you business and that wouldn't make sense. However, there are some businesses where you can just do it as an educational series where there isn't, you know, necessarily a direct call to action. You know, it might be a specific business leader, uh, but really, you know, I think just as Sydney said in the last presentation, going and being involved in your local um, ribbon cuttings. Whenever a new business opens, you have someone showing up that's going to be wearing your branding or just a name tag, or maybe it's just mentioned. Well, what happens with that is as the business is excited to share that they just opened a brand new location, you're gonna be, your staff or you, it's gonna be right there front and center. And so it's going to be cross published and it's, you're not paying anything. It's going to be published on other social media sites. You go on and you tag yourself, you know, um, small credit union was so happy to be there. We're excited for you. You know, it's getting published in your uh, Rotary Club, in your newsletters with the chamber. Um, those kinds of relationships are so important. I think it's also really fantastic to join community initiatives. So an example would be I'm in Hall County. So a massive community initiative is they are trying to build out all the green space within our community. So they're trying to improve the local parks. So they have these organized events where all these business leaders within the community are going out. And it's just making sure that you are aware of your branding. If you're offering a small business loan or something of that nature, you're finding those kind of line items that make sense where you can be involved in the community and also just continue to put your brand out there. Attending networking events, um, 
are great, but really to get that that ROI and get that, you know, that return is actually following up with those business cards that you hand out. We don't want to just spray our business cards like confetti. Um, but if you really follow up with some of these people, eventually you keep reaching out to them, they might just message you for, let's just say an auto loan, something like that. So it's just building that network around your credit union that you're the safe place to land. Yeah. Um, personalized member service. You know, I really think that personalized member service is something that you're already doing, right? It, you have built trust within your community. You have given a lot of loyalty um, or, or you have gained a lot of loyalty with your membership base. Uh, you know how your members want to be treated. And it's really good for your personalized member service to be anticipating the needs of your members. You know, that's what really differentiates your credit union from, you know, maybe the mid-sized credit union or the larger bank down the street is you actually are listening to your membership. But what I think would be really important is, is when you invest in your membership service, you can really create those meaningful and long-lasting relationships. You know, it increases the satisfaction of your staff and your members, and it can, you know, really drive business growth. So what it is, is as you deploy these campaigns, as you put this information out into the community, you're collecting the data or you're just making notes of what you're seeing and what you're hearing, um, training the staff with that, and then personalizing the communication that's being sent out. You know, I think it's leveraging the technology that you're already having to pay for. There are analytics available on almost every platform, and then you can adjust your messaging as you need to going forward. All right. So essentially, this kind of brings everything back to where we are. To, so if we're going to execute a marketing plan, you know, we have to set some really clear goals. You know, we have to define our target audience. We have to develop our messaging, decide how we're going to do our marketing mix, whether it's online, social media, and how we're going to execute our plan. And then, you know, if we need to pivot, that's absolutely an option. But the most important thing is spending the time, sit down, review your results, and see what kind of adjustments you can make or if there's any room for adjustments. You know, it depends on whatever your credit union is trying to promote. So we're coming into spring. If you're trying to promote, you know, an auto loan, you know, how will that look? Okay, are we going to offer any type of incentive, you know, for every auto loan that's refinanced from a different credit union or a different bank, they get entered in for a drawing, you know, how are you going to get that messaging out? And so, you know, whenever you're creating these campaigns, I think it's just important. Not let's not just say it. Let's plan it. Let's see how we're going to do it, and let's see how we read the results. So much. Um, overall, by combining a lot of these strategies with other low-cost marketing options, I think you can really create a comprehensive plan that helps your credit union stand out from the competition. With that I have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Misty, for all of that fantastic marketing information. Thank and at you. this point, I would like to open it up to our credit unions to see maybe what marketing challenges have you seen so far, or maybe what channels work best for your credit union. Is anybody exploring any new marketing tactics for 2023? What about maybe some different community organizations that your credit union has partnered with? Diane, I know you have some great marketing. And Thomas, you always find some creative connections as well. All right, well, one more second for, oh, I see Thomas in the chat, social media. 
And we do have Chelsea on the phone too. Chelsea, anything to share? All right. Well, with that, I will give us just a moment. We have a break scheduled next to give everyone just a moment to get a coffee. And Diane, yes, so a knack for Facebook posts. So I would be curious to dive into some analytics to really see what, what's working best because really dependent upon your field of membership and your location, that can have some variation. So once you find that voice of your brand, the voice of your credit union, which it seems like Chelsea has thankfully done for y'all, then it's a home run from there. All right. Well, next we have our break coming up from just a 15 minute break kicking off again um, at 10 Central, 11 Eastern. So give everyone just a moment to refill those coffees get a restroom break in, check through some of those emails. And when we come back, we will be going through some enhanced interview techniques and then open it up for an open discussion for sharing some trends from you all around fraud and other hot topics you may be seeing as we have the group together. So see you back in just a few minutes. Back everyone. Hope everyone had the chance to grab. Oh, Evan, I see you got a coffee refill. Good job. <laughs> Hopefully everyone is staying caffeinated, had that nice chance to look over anything that may have come in while we are filling our brains with some nice brain food on this Monday morning. So next, I am going to go ahead and kick us off for our next speaker, where we will be discussing enhanced interviewing and counseling skills from our member engagement consultant, Avery Ragsdale. Avery started his credit union journey with Family Savings Credit Union as a part-time loan auditor before working his way into an inbound lending specialist position. He then transitioned into the marketing department as a de the business development representative, working primarily in the Georgia market branches on market penetration and community outreach. He also received his CUDE in early 2022 and it was selected to establish and grow the new centralized outbound lending department for Family Savings Credit Union. Currently, Avery serves as the member engagement consultant for Georgia and North Alabama, primarily working with small credit unions on growth and best practices. And with that, Avery, I will turn it over to you. Good morning, everybody, and um, thank you all for joining and letting me pre, uh, present. Um, I'm happy to be able to talk to everybody about lending. Um, we'll be going over a wide range of material. So at any time you have any questions, feel free to stop me, um, ask questions. Hopefully you can see my presentation right now. Um, so there is a good bit of information. So if I do talk quickly, that is why. Um, so I do apologize in advance for that. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. One of our primary jobs as financial professionals is transferring financial education to our members. Um, everyone will have their own technique of doing this, but there are some great foundation points and resources that I would like to go over um, to, to help with this. Uh, as you can see, this is a great visual that I always like to have on hand when discussing financial education and primarily credit counseling with members. Um, let's say um, a member does not have a credit card, is hesitant on getting one. This is something we want to offer but are having a hard time. There are losing points on their score. It's something we will talk about, but this is a great example of trying to, to just point them in the direction that they need to go. Uh, as you can see, a 580 to a 730, that's a big difference. We all know that, but it's just trying to visually show the member what that difference is. To them, it's probably just a number. To us, it's a big difference when it comes to interest rate with risk-based lending, what they can get approved for. It has all kinds of factors that they just may not understand. Um, again, visually, it's always great to have something this is a document that just has a good 
a wide range of information. What makes up your credit score? It's always great to go over that with the member. Everybody knows that payment history is very important in lending. But from what I've noticed, I always like to ask members what they feel their payment history makes up. And I always hear 90% of their score, stuff like that, really high numbers. So they don't understand the, the range of what goes into your credit score and why it's so important to have the different segments and what makes up those segments. So that's a fantastic thing to go over. Um, actions that hurt your score, another great point to go over. Um, it's always good to tell the members just straight up, if you miss a payment, you're gonna lose 60 to 100 points. A lot of them may not know that. They know that it's gonna hurt their score, but they don't know that it's gonna hurt that much. And just giving that incentive to want to make their payments on time is a, a beneficial action, not only for the credit union, um, but for the member in their credit score. Again, um, more buying power, less lower loan payments. Another great example from last slide, just to have on a quick access one pager when going over everything with a member. Um, actions that improve your score. We want to try to give the members a roadmap on growing their credit score, improving their, their position financially, um, where, when it, whether it's with um, budgeting, um, credit worthiness, pretty much anything. Our job is to not only just tell them, but to give them that plan. Um, and that's kind of what's gonna lead us into the next couple of slides. Um, something I did wanna to touch on, I know we're all credit experts on this call. So capacity is something we all know, second largest factor that makes up your credit score. I do wanna to touch a little bit deeper on capacity though, because there's, there's a formula that a lot of people don't understand or don't fully grasp how capacity actually affects your score. We all know that if you have a balance on your card, your credit cards, your revolving lines, your line of credits, your score is gonna drop. And something we hear nonstop is keep a balance around 30% of, of your limits. That's something credit card companies push. That's something banks push. And the reason they push that is the only uh, is the only idea I can come up with is because that's how they make money. They don't make money unless you have balances on the cards. And that's not why we're in business. We're not for profit institutions. So we're out for the, uh, the best position for the members. Um, so to further on that, what I've noticed, what, what I've been trained on, what I train on is roughly for every point, for every percent you have used on your revolving limits, it drops your score one point. So for example, if you have a combined limit, revolving limits, it can be credit cards, line of credits, whatever the, uh, the combined limit is, it's $10,000. If you have, again, a combined balance of $4,000, you're using 40%. So roughly, that member is going to lose 40 points off their score. Now that's important to, to push to the member because if you go on Credit Karma, right on the front screen is 30%, get your cards down to 30%. Now, if you do that, it's a good point if they're at 90% to have that goal to work down to 30%. But once they get there, they're still losing 30 points off their score roughly. And as credit experts and financial professionals trying to better the members, that's not something I can rightfully tell the member to, to do. Um, in my best practice, it would be to try to pay the card down as low as possible, as close to zero as you can, and then use it once a month, low payment, something you already have budgeted, you can pay it off right away. Um, now, with that example, a lot of members are scared to have credit cards, whether it's something that it's been just a family thing. Parents had a bad, bad uh, issue with credit cards. It got transitioned down to the kids. They're just scared of them. They don't know how to use them. They don't need them. It's the same thing. So it's looked at as if you have a $0 limit, a $0 balance. That means you're using 100% of the available limits. You're going to lose roughly 100 points off your score. So if you're ever looking at a credit, credit report and you just can't tell why it's as low as it is, as it is. Um, they make their payments on time. They do everything that they're supposed to. If they don't have a credit card, that's usually why. And it's a very, very quick fix to offer them a credit card and to go over all of this. Now, again, 
one pagers. Education is one of our main goals as credit unions. Um, a document that I always like to look over and have on hand. Um, I've seen people laminate this, have it on their desk. I'll pull it up for us to be able to look at. But laminate it, put it on your desk. It is um, right on it directly, print it out for the members, email it to them. You can write directly on this. You can type directly in this. Uh, again, a plan to action, a plan to grow. Um, it has all the information we've already gone over. What makes a credit score, what actions hurt your score, how to improve your score, um, what the score differences can affect um, positively. And then we can go ahead and just make a plan. Pay down credit card bills, make your payments on time, open a credit card, um, different things like that, consolidate your balances, make a budget, create a savings account. Um, these are things that we can offer to the member um, because as we know, as credit unions, when we have a loan that gets declined, it shouldn't be a no. It should never just be a no. It should be a not yet. Here's the plan that we can put you on track when we look again in the future. That is That should be our uh, goal. And that's a great thing f uh, as education. Um, I do want to open it up. I know we have some chatty folks on this morning. Um, so what tools, techniques, and tactics do you use personally in your opinion in financially educating your members? I would love to hear it. Um, feel free to come off mute or put it in the chat um, any way you prefer. And I see we have Thomas in this chat. Yes, sir, we will be sharing these slides as well as the additional PDFs for you. Perfect. So we'll move on. Um, now, continuing on financial education. So I did want to make everyone aware that the Southeastern Credit Union Foundation, um, the foundation and part of the league, has some excellent options for materials, including videos, um, flyers and tools to share with your members directly, as well as programs like Books Make Sense, um, an interactive way to introduce students to credit unions um, and basic financial concepts and enrich credit union financial well wellness program. This is a program that is specific in educating your, um, your staff further in their own financial wellness and education. Um, our, our foundation team is fantastic. Um, again, contact your member engagement consultant or your liaison, and we can get you part paired up with the foundation to get all this material. What is man? What is measuring good performance? What is management and the board of directors focused on? What do you look at when you're measuring good performance by a loan officer or an underwriter? Um, I do want everybody just to, to ponder on this. Give it, a, give it a couple seconds of thought. What do you look at? What is good performance to you? What is good performance to the board? Um, what do they ask about? What's the first thing that you look at? And I'll give you a second before we go on. Perfect. So for a lot of people, especially boards of directors, from what I've seen, um, it's delinquency rates, charge offs. Um, those are the two main things that draw your eyes. Um, now, rightfully so, it's a good, they're good ratio, good numbers to look at. But let's take a deeper look. We can see that loan officer one and loan officer two, their delinquencies, charge offs differ very, very widely between the two of them. Um, so let's take a deeper look at their performance sheet. Um, again, you can see the delinquencies and charge-offs. The loan officer one, the conservative loan officer, has a very low delinquency, very low charge-off, but you can see their approval rate is 50%. Um, they have a lot of loans declined, and we'll go over that a little bit more later on. Uh, because they have so many declined loans, they're only doing 200,000 in loan volume a month. 
This also means that the loans they are getting approved are most likely plus an A with a little bit of B tier um, sprinkled in, which is why their loan yield is only four and a half percent. With the charge offs being 0.1%, this brings their net yield to 4.4 um, and net income to 8,800 a month or 105,000 a year. If we look at loan officer two, the aggressive loan officer, um, now let's make it clear that aggressive does not mean let's give everybody a loan. Um, that has been tried many times and it has never worked from what I've seen. So, but again, we'll go over that a little bit more later on in this presentation. Um, loan officer two has a much higher delinquency rate, 2.25% and a high charge off of 1.75%. Now these are inflated numbers. These are high. These are high to what I think a good delinquency and charge off ratio are. So we can still see that even with in like inflated numbers, what the difference can still show. Um, if most lending supervisors or directors look at these two numbers, they probably would have a heart attack if they saw a charge-off ratio of 1.75%. Um, but if we look further, their approval ratio is 90%, which means the loan officer is helping more members. That's the number one goal for us. This allows their loan volume to be $1 million a month. Um, because they are approving lower tiers, their loan yield is 9%, bringing their net yield to 7.25%. My goal for any credit union is a net loan yield of 7%, so that's right at it. Um, this has their net income of 72500 per month or 870000 a year. Um, this means that loan officer two, um, the aggressive loan officer, is helping more members and bringing in more income to the credit union. So... We can see that um, we don't want to just primarily look at charge-offs and delinquencies. We have to look at the full picture, um, what's going in, what's coming out. Now, we will move on to determining the credit score direction. I won't spend a lot of time on this, um, as this, is, this can be talked about for a while. Um, and due to time constraints, we, we'll go over it quickly. Um, FICO score indicators. You may have noticed on the credit report there's four numbers. Um, you probably, you may have never known what they're for. You might just skip over them. If you do know what they are, you may not know how to, how to utilize them in the best way possible. Out of the four numbers, the first two that you see um, are going to be the highest weighted codes. These codes show the main factors that are affecting the score, and they show what direction the score is going. Sorry about that. Um, My fault. I did not mean to just mute you. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, direction is the biggest, the biggest thing, the takeaway we can take from the factors. As you can see, there's a list on the left, a list on the right of the score codes that will show up on the credit report. The down arrow means the score is trending down. The up arrow means the score is trending up. I would like to take a quick note and say that if you have a member that their score is in the 800s, the codes are gonna show most likely that the score is trending down because that's the only way the score can go besides stay stationary and vice versa on the opposite end. Um, we will move on. I do want to just ask if there's anyone actually using the score indicators. Is it something that you use when you're reviewing a uh, credit report? Again, feel free to, um, to jump off mute or put it in the chat. It would be usually it's listed after or right before the um, financial summary section of a credit report where you see the, um, the revolving limits, revolving usage, payments on time. It's usually right around that area, depending on what where you get your report, um, but it should be on there. I can send out a redacted credit report after as well that kind of highlights some sections that that's going to be on. Thank you, Chelsea. Okay, I will jump ahead. I will skip a couple just because of time constraints. We all should have a pretty decent understanding of what 
ratios to look at um, age of borrower employment, DTI, UDR, SDR, things like that. And we all know how to calculate that. And again, these slides will be going out after the uh, after the meeting. So you should have all of this information coming out to you. Um, inflated income. I do want to briefly touch on this. I won't go over it in too much depth, but this is a fantastic indicator right now, at least with the um, with the upcoming possibility of a recession. Inflated income is something that we can utilize to see what a member's financial profile will look like in the future, not just where it is right now. It may look good right now, but there's going to be some things going on in the credit report in their financial profile that's showing that maybe a few months, few years down the road, they're not going to be in as good of a position as they are now. Inflated income is when a member is living off of more than they make. They're living off of revolving loans, unsecured loans, payday loans. Um, they're living above their means. And how do we calculate this? Um, there is an Excel sheet that I've put together that I, again, will send out. You put the information in. In the, uh, in the sheet, the number of months open, balance, and payments are the main ones you want to look at. As you can see, when we put those in, it goes and calculates the oldest account opened within the past 24 months is what we want to look at. Um, the combined total of those opened within the 24 months and the combined payment, the minimum payment for revolving loans. Um, it goes over the calculation. It does all the math for you. You put in the monthly income and it'll calculate 7% of the gross monthly income, the MGI. You want that actual percentage that you see, the 13, 22, 22, you want that to be lower or right at the 7% of the uh, MGI, the monthly gross income. As you can see in this example, it is well above 7%. So that means this member in this example is living off of inflated income. And they are in a very bad trend for bankruptcy, most likely. So that's something that we want to try to get squashed as soon as we see it. Um, going ahead, this is one of my favorite. I'll briefly read through this. This is a story that some of you may have heard before, um, but I just want to touch on a few few parts. In Washington, D.C., uh, at a subway station on January um, in 2007, a man with a violin played six Bach pieces for about 45 minutes. During that time, 2,000 people went through the station. Um, on and off a couple minutes, um, people stopped. Kids tried to stop, but their parents would pull them. Nobody really paid too much attention throughout the whole 45 minutes. After an hour, he finished playing. No one really noticed. No one applauded. There was no recognition. And he just packed his stuff up and left. Now, no one knew this, but the violinist was Jock Bell heard him. Some of you may have heard of him, but he is one of the best musicians in the world. Um, and he played one of the most intric intricate pieces ever written with a violin worth $4 million. Now, this was in a subway in New York, so he's a, he's a very brave man for doing that. Um, but two days before, Joshua Bell sold out a theater in Boston where the seats averaged $200 each to sit and listen to him play the same music. Um, this was a true story. Joshua played incognito in the metro station um, and it was organized by the Washington Post as a part of a social experiment about perception, taste, and people's priorities. Now, we can take that in our day-to-day. -day. How, um, how many things are we missing in life? What are we passing on because we're in a rush? We're, we're in too much of a hurry. We're just, we're blind. we have our blinders on going about our day. Now, this can be transitioned into lending. If we're just going through the same motions, we are missing items. We're missing opportunities to help our members. We're missing opportunities to say yes to loans instead of a lot of opportunities to say no. How do we approve loans? How can we say yes is what we should be looking at as lenders, not ways to say, not reasons to say no. Um, so what we need to do is see what no one else sees. We have to be the best lenders out there. We, have, we don't want to be the big banks. We don't want to be the AI lending programs that just look at if you make enough money, if your credit scores at a certain criteria, if your um, DTI is in a certain place, your ratios are good. We don't want to be that because we know we've lived it ourselves. 
bad things can happen to good people. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Bad things can happen to good people. Now, when we're looking at a credit report, we have to understand this. We have to be able to realize that some pieces of their credit report might have been tainted by bad things that happened to that good person. They might not have paid that loan back. Why? It's not because they didn't want to. It's because they couldn't. They might have been going through a divorce. They might have had a family member pass away. They might have lost their job. COVID might have happened. And yes, Rita, the story really does change your perception as a perceptive as a lender. Um, it's, it's very important to get that story. And that's something we're going to go over a little bit more here. Interviewing, developing interview skills. And this is not interviewing when you're interviewing a candidate for a position at, at your credit union. But some of those same, same uh, skills can be transitioned. This is interviewing the member when they're applying for a loan. You are the trusted financial expert. And the member is calling you for your help and advice. You need to make sure your staff has the skills um, to provide world-class service, world-class lending service. Can they listen to identify a member's needs? Do they know which products and services will best suit the member? Um, using analytical skills to understand the traits and the score in relation to the member's life stage. Um, understand the direction of the score and how to build a loan. Again, the loan interview should be a, it should be a conversation, not an interrogation. Um, you're going to find out very quickly if you try to interrogate a member, um, they're going to shut down. They're not going to, they're not going to answer the questions you want. Um, they're not going to give you the information you need. They're going to shut down. They're going to put up a wall and it's just going to be a very one-sided conversation. So have that conversation. And luckily on the small credit union side, you have the opportunity to have that relationship with a member. Most of you already have that relationship with a member. So it makes it easier to have that conversation, to have that tough conversation, ask those tough questions. Um, and now Chelsea, I do like to, that you do ask for the backstory. What happened is a fantastic way to, to get a member to open up. And having that small credit union trust, having that personal relationship with the members is a great way to get them to open up. Um, when you are a good interview, you interviewer, you'll be able to find the best products and services for the member. Now, you're probably going to hear me get, you're probably going to get tired of me hearing me um, say to know your products and services, have your staff know your products and services. I'm going to say it probably 10 more times by the end of this presentation, but it's so important to have your staff, you yourself know what your products and services are, what your current rates are, and how they differ from other financial institutions. Um, you want to find a way to make the loan, like I said earlier. Um, make the ultimate decision maker's job much easier. Whoever underwrites the loan, you want to give them the most tools they can have. They have all the ratios. They have the credit report in front of them. What they don't have is the ability to have talked to the member like you did. You had the story. Now we have to be able to convey that to the underwriter. So they have what we had. Um, you want the member to say, wow, they really care about me and took the time to listen and make it happen. Now, some, some members are going to go in a little, a little headstrong. Some are going to be very embarrassed at their situation. So being able to get them to open up is something that it is our job to be able to, to make them feel comfortable in doing. Um, I do want to open it up quickly. I know I've seen a couple of things in the chat, but what are different ways that you found that work best to have your members open up to you? How do you get the story? That We all know the story is so important, but how do you get them to open up? Again, feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. Okay, Chelsea said relating to their story and circumstances, very good way. Um, we, we've, all, um, we've all had life happen and life sometimes can be very hard. So being able to relate to their story and, and comfort them and that they're not alone is something that can go a long way. And Rita said, again, making them feel comfortable sharing their financial need is very important. Make them feel at ease. Again, it is a, they're coming to you most of the time 
at a low point in their life. One of the lowest points most of the time is they need something in a pinch. Now, if they're shopping for a car, sometimes that can be a little bit different. They're not coming to you at a bad time, but most, some of the time they're coming to you at a place of vulnerability. So making them feel comfortable is very important. Um, something that I do want to put out, we're not going to go over it um, as in depth as I would like, but again, this will go out. This is something that I created when I was in lending. Um, it is a loan notes template. So all I do is the stuff in the box is not there, but I did want to put that. So it gives you a direction of what should go into those boxes. It has purpose, motivation, why the credit union, why today, monthly payment, very important down payment if they're buying a car or other collateral, um, housing, what do they do? What's their situation? Employment, um, additional household income, always something very, very, very important to get is they're compensating income into the household. It may not be as a co-signer or a co-borrower on the loan, but is there income that they can use worst case scenario, whether that's a spouse or other means? Can they have somebody um, sign on the loan with them? If worst case scenario, I always like to ask if the underwriter comes back and says, we're not able to do this with just you, who would you who would you be able to call? Would you have somebody? Now, somebody that I used to work with that is a lot more bold than I am um, when they're asking is who would who would you call if you were in jail? Who would your phone call be? That is who you would probably have signed on a loan with you. Um, I was never able to ask that, but he was um, and he was able to get a lot of laughs out of it. So that's something you could try, um, but something I was not bold enough to do relationship with the credit union again your underwriter can see this but it's good to make quick note pfi primary financial institution who do they go to who do they do their business with on a regular basis if it's not us what are they driving it's always good to get the values um assets mileage year make model all the information pull the values so there's opportunities that we're going to talk about here in a little bit with cross-selling credit make note of the story this is where a lot of the story comes in what tr what direction is the score trending up or down we've ran the uh, score codes um, any significant items on the credit report charge offs bankruptcies late payments what happened what's the story with that we can we can tr transition that over to the underwriter um, any cross sell items and then a recommendation I like to put recommendations whenever I can. Now it's not a it's not a necessity on every loan. Sometimes we won't have a recommendation. Sometimes we just want to hand it over to the underwriter and we just want to list the facts. But if I feel strongly about a loan, I'm going to recommend approval. And here's why. It's always good to list intent, ability, and a parachute. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but again, ability, quick ability is can they pay the loan back? Intent is do they show the intent to pay the loan back in a parachute are different ways that we can secure that they will pay it back. Direct deposit, auto drafted payments, um, long time relationship with the credit union, just things like that. Um, now, I think going on, we have a, I, I won't open this up unless you wanna go ahead and put something in the chat. From looking over the chat and seeing all the messages, um, I think I have a pretty good idea that we do care very much about loan notes, but if you had to weigh how you as a decision maker or your underwriters take into consideration loan notes, how, how many loan notes do your loan officers type to um, for the underwriter to read? One, little or no weight, two, decent amount of weight, or three, very important. Um, they hold a lot of weight. I would love to see different people put that in to see where, where we are as a, as a group. Three, perfect, Rita. That's fantastic. I love to see that. Thomas, three. Perfect. Good. We have a good group. We're doing all the things right. Perfect. Now, I will go through this quicker um, than I would like, but I don't want to take up too much of everybody's time. Cross-selling um, is something that we need to be well-versed in. We need to train, train, train our frontline staff at how to do this, um, what to look for, what are key items that we need to be able to, um, to look at when looking over a credit report, when hearing a member story, when looking at their account. We have to be able to do this. Now, how do we do this? 
we have to know the products and services. Again, I know I told you you're going to get tired of me saying it, but we have to know what the best option would be for that member at that time. Now, it could be more than one products and services. Um, it could be just one, um, but we have to be able to find options for the member to best benefit not only the credit union by growing that, but the member, because if we believe in our products, then it should be a no brainer. And that's something we're going to talk about. Now, I know that I know what word just popped in everybody's head. Um, so I'm sorry for that, but it is sell the sell mindset, sell selling salesperson. Those are considered bad words. Now I am a salesman. I have been a salesman in the past. I don't think of them as bad words. Now, when you do think of a salesperson, when you think of a salesman, what do you think of? Um, for me, it is a, a used car salesman. Nobody, sorry for all the used car salesmen or car salesmen in the past on this call, but nobody likes to deal with car salesmen. They have the perception of being liars. Um, as you can see by Pinocchio here, um, he shows a bad profession as a used car salesman because they are known to be liars. Now, a lot of frontline staff have that connotation of salesmen. They don't want to be that. They don't want to sell to the members. They don't want to have that perception that they're selling because they know what it feels like to be sold to. Now, how do we fix that? Um, how do we get them to get more comfortable in this? Now, the mindset of selling should not, it should be a good one. It shouldn't be bad. We are not just selling. We're offering a product or service that we believe in um, to put the member in a better, set, better situation. This is how we get the frontline staff to jump on board of this. If we truly believe, if we truly believe in our credit unions, products and services, then we're not, then we are doing our members a disservice by not offering them, by not selling them. If your frontline staff really, really, truly believes in the products and services that you offer, then you're, they're doing a disservice to the member by not selling them. That is something that they have to understand. Um, we have to be able to change the mindset of selling. It is a, is a strong mindset that a lot of people are very passionate about. They don't want to sell, but it's something that we have to do. Um, now, again, Selling is not a bad word. Um, selling should not be looked at as bad. Your products and services inside and out. Ask questions. That's a big thing. We should be able to see the. Um, we should be able to see um, different ways when talking to the members by asking them questions. Know those prompting questions to cross sell items, to put the member in a better situation. If they're struggling to, if they come to you and say, I'm having a hard time make, paying my bills on time, work with them on a budget. Is there a program that you have that can set them up for better success? If they are having a hard time um, making, if they're having a bad month, can skip a pay, is skip a pay an option, um, overdraft? These are all things that we, by asking questions, by listening to things that are being said, but things that are not being said as well, that's what that's that's our job. And that's what we need to try to transition to the frontline staff into understanding um, how to look for opportunities. Again, very quickly, um, if they have other collateral loans on the credit report, if yes, um, get the value, get the information. What's their interest rate? What's their term? If we can lower the interest rate, if we can lower their payments to free up some disposable income, this is things that we need to be finding out. These are things that can help the member. Um, we don't want to put the member in a, bad, a worse situation. We don't want to raise the interest rate. That is when selling becomes bad if we're putting the member in a worse situation. But I know nobody on this call is going to do this, and they're not going to train the staff to do this. Can we pull equity out of out of the vehicles to pay off unsecured debt? Can we lower that interest rate? They have a $10,000 personal loan and $10,000 in equity in their car they own. Why not refinance that car with us instead of paying 15% on a, on a, on a personal loan um, and always offering uh, loan products? If they aren't, what are they driving? What do they own? How are they getting around? Again, is there ways to refinance this to pull equity out and pay off other higher loans that aren't with us? Um, if they do have auto with us, again, equity, big, big thing, loan products. And I always look at, quick side note, is negative equity. Negative equity is looked at to me as unsecured. 
Um, so anything over 100% LTV is now unsecured. Um, looking beyond auto loans, unsecured loans, installments. Don't be afraid to refinance unsecured installment loans too. If they're paying 25% over to buy here, pay here, why not bring us over at 12% with us, 10% with us? They're going to save money. We're going to be able to free up disposable. We're going to put that member in a better situation. We have to figure out what their current interest rate is. There's different calculators to do this if they're not comfortable with asking. It's always good to have that information going into that conversation beforehand. Um, just tell the member, it looks like you're paying 22% on this. That's crazy. Let's refinance that. Let's do this, 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 or this here. So we put you in a better situation. Um, credit cards, do they have ours? We talked earlier about how they can lose points by not having the capacity, the available limits. If they do have a credit card, are they struggling with low balance or high balances to limits? Do they not have high limits on their cards? Do they have high interest rates? Can we do a balance transfer? Um, different. There's so many different ways that we can um, push our products in a way to help the member, not just because it benefits the credit union by adding these products and offering these, but because it helps the member. It puts them in a better situation. Um, I will wrap it up because I have gone over and I'm sure everybody, um, but I'm sure everybody's probably cussing me out um, behind their camera, but I do want to take the final opportunity for questions. So again, feel free to come off mute or put it in the chat, questions, comments, anything's available or I'm happy to answer. Um, other than that, thank you all for your time and allowing me to present. I was happy to do so. If you have any questions, my contact information is on the screen and most of you should have it already anyways. Thank you so much, Avery. And everyone, our last item for today is an open discussion. So please, please do not hesitate to go ahead and ask any questions that you may have after Avery's presentation. And for those of you who may not have had the chance to meet Avery just yet, Avery, I could not be more excited to introduce you to so many amazing credit unions today. And I'm excited for that opportunity. Avery has just passed his uh, 127 days or so with LSCU, so we'll, least, we'll lose count here pretty soon. It looks like we are seeing a great follow-up opportunity already. So yes, let's get that on the calendar. Awesome. Well, if there are no questions regarding today's presentations from any of our speakers, I do want to use the last few minutes of our time as promised for open discussion from you and your peers. And I will go ahead and kick us off with the first question. And it is for everybody in the group. What would you all like to see on future small credit union summits? We are excited to have Linda Bodie, who for those of you who are at GAC, Linda will be joining us for our small credit union roundtable at SCUC this year. And excitedly, she was very deservingly awarded the Herb Wagner um, Lifetime Achievement Award. So very excited to have her. But what additional topics would you like to see at these? throughout this year? Because our goal is you tell us what you need and we'll go out and get it. Yes, Diane, we are incredibly excited to have Linda. And for those of you who have not checked out the 2023 Herb Wagner Award winner videos, let me know. I will send you the link. It is the best five minute video to start your week seeing some awesome, awesome and creative marketing ideas. Hey, Alicia, it's Diane. Hey, can Diane. You, hey, can you send that video to me? I sure will. I will go okay. ahead and put it in the chat, actually. I've actually had the um, pleasure of see, listening to her twice, and I'll see her. I guess we'll see her in June, but she is wonderful. She comes up, I don't know how, uh, she just got a creative brain. 
<clears throat> yes, she, um, well, I don't want to give away too much for those of you who haven't seen the video. So if you haven't, please check it out in just one second. Okay, thank you. Of course. I don't know about anybody else, but um, we're getting a little short on liquidity <laughs> and um, just put out a CD special and um, we are a closed membership. So it's kind of hard sometimes to market. Um, so, I mean, we're using Facebook. We have a newsletter that comes out quarterly. I mean, is there any other way? Of course you can say new money, but then when your members want to move their money, you know, so we just let them do it. We don't just say, I mean, we open it up to any money. So they just move their money from the regular savings to the CD because they might move it to another financial institution if you don't let them do that. I, Diane, there anybody got any creative ideas to get some money? Hey, Miss Diane, have you, this is Thomas from Calhoun Liberty. Have you, hey. looked, at, have you looked at C Note? No. C Note is a national group. Um, they try to help smaller credit unions uh, across the way. They actually get money, and I know this is going to sound absolutely crazy, but they get money from Apple, Visa, Patagonia, all of the places like that, and they they'll typically purchase your two year certificate, so it's a lower cost funds at that standpoint, and you can opt at how much liquidity you want. But another credit unit our size actually shared it with me out of uh, Karma Parish, out of uh, Indiana, shared it all with me when we were at one of the events a uh, while okay. back. But it's it's awesome, and I can I'll forward that information to Alicia, and she can if it's okay, she'll. She'll get it to all of y'all, but it it doesn't cost you any money. They actually pay the folks to to um, to invest that service into smaller credit unions. So, okay, yeah, I'd love to look into it. Um, yeah, I, I not sure what else you know what else to do besides I, we could start offering CDs like through Simply CD. That was going to be my next step if we don't get anything from the members. Yeah, we, we did the same thing through Simply or some of the processes like that before we came along C-Note. So then we started okay. slowing down on that part because we hit the same speed bump that you did. Members only have so much money anyway and trying to get other people to bring other money in. And these rate shoppers are, you know... Oh, we have them. <laughs> they just... Yeah, we... We had one that paid a fourteen thousand dollar penalty the other day to cash theirs in. That all he was was a rate shopper, and oh my goodness, oh my, goodness. it didn't That's bother crazy. me at all because <laughs> it, it was blowing up my part of the balance sheet when he did what he did. So, but I heard he's already moved it from the institution that he took it to already. So that is crazy. All right, well I'll look at that. I mean I don't we're not totally squished yet, but um looking at that down the road so trying to be proactive <clears throat> we're about 92 percent lent savings to loan well my my question for all of y'all is is what about salaries and hourly wages are y'all getting is everybody else getting a push on that as well um, i'm not but and my both I think all three of my, I only have three employees. I think they're all on the line, all listening, but hopefully they think they're being paid well. <laughs> um, yeah, I haven't had that problem. Stacy or Carrie? No, I, I don't have any issues with salary, thank goodness. I'm like Diane. I'm a closed membership. There's only five of us here. So, um, you know, things are going pretty good. I am losing a little bit of liquidity like Diane is as well. It's hard being a closed membership trying to get, you know, there's just only so much you can do. Right. And that's the hard thing. Yep, it is. So you, you're, well, I've got four, we got, I got four all together and you got five. 
<laughs> well, I have four and a half. I have four and then one part time who only works oh, okay. three so days we're a week. So, um, yeah, it's it's really hard. It is hard. Yeah, and I <laughs> see no light at the end of the tunnel. For, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, hopefully I'm, things are going to turn around. I think you just have to be good to your employees, you know. Yes. Yes. And when they need to be go to the doctor or they have a sick child, you you just have to be good to them and they'll be good to you. No, yeah. I, yeah, I agree street. with that wholeheartedly, but unfortunately some of the bigger national banks are poaching employees and they're starting them out at $20 an hour. So when you're in a rural community, that is that's strong. So, yeah. Yeah, that is. Yep. Well, that's something that we'll continue to keep an eye on and continue keeping in touch on. One other way that I wanted to make sure that everybody has the chance to see is we've also created a small credit union community using the same Connect platform that the LSCU councils do. So I know that many of you use the CUNA Small Credit Union Community. I see your faces on there all the time when I check that out too. Um, so just know that there is an additional resource to continue having conversations like these, or if you have a quick question that you just want to pose to the group, please be sure to check that out. Susan has just dropped that link into the chat and it is also on the Small Credit Union um, Toolkit page on lscu.coop as well. So definitely check that out. And any other resources, are there other resources that your league can be providing to you all as small credit unions? Because again, I want to ensure that if there is a need out there that we are hearing from you all, that we have our ear to the ground and are able to get a solution for you as quickly as possible. So as you're just looking at the year ahead, is there anything that you're like, gosh, I wish that there was somebody that could help out with that? Well, if you do see anything, please never hesitate to send that over my way because the more feedback that we receive, the more that we will be able to continue growing those. And then I also wanted to mention, as Evan just dropped in the chat, we are incredibly excited and honored to not only be able to host the Small Credit Union Roundtable at SCUSI with Linda Bodie, but also hosting an additional in-person small credit union event. And of course, we love to have all of our credit unions from Alabama, Florida, and Georgia. But actually this fall, we are going to do it one bigger and we will be hosting the National Small Credit Union Roundtable this fall in Huntsville, Alabama. So you will see some joint marketing going out from CUNA and even other credit union leagues coming together. The agenda is still in the works as they're securing some of those speakers, but I want you, if you are able to make it to either of those events, they are going to be a can't miss opportunity. Again, that was one of the things that we heard from you all in creating additional opportunities to get together and connect. So whether it is through the connect, uh -huh, see what I did there, the connect virtual platform or additional in person and in virtual when we can. So make sure you check that out and remember that there are scholarships available through the Southeastern Credit Union Foundation. And as small credit unions, I want you to know that those are for you on top of your small credit union initiative funds. So never have financial barriers be something that stops you from attending any event or professional development opportunity. What other questions for the group do y'all have this morning? All right, well, I will give it just one more moment in case anybody may be typing something in the chat, but 
Otherwise, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us for our first Small Credit Union Summit of 2023. Again, our next summit will be held in June in Orlando, Florida at SCUSI for our Small Credit Union in-person roundtable, followed by another in-person event in September. And with that, I hope that this has started your week off with some energy, with some connections and some fresh ideas. We, of course, as promised, will be following up with the slides from today's presentations as well as some of the workshop or worksheets and additional materials. I want to thank all of our speakers, Misty and Avery and Sydney. Thank you so much for joining us today. And again, please never hesitate to reach out if there's anything we can do, even if it's just something that you're sure there's nothing we can do, but reach out, never hesitate to be a stranger and hope to see you all soon. Thank you.